thank you to AAIDD, uh, Matt and Dan and everybody else uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, basically share what I have learned in my, both in my training as well as my training. So what we saw yesterday was a wonderful uh, information um, based on research, you know, cutting edge research, or mainly uh, about the topic of uh, fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids and their role in, uh, in the brain and mental health. What I'm going to do today is really translate that research into practice because I am one of you guys that really out in the front lines and that's where I feel most comfortable, that's where my passion is. And what I have done with my training in psychiatry as well as in integrative medicine is really cull all this research that's out there, giving me that bird's eye view about everything that's floating out there, looking at mental illness um, from a different perspective, and synthesizing this information from different schools of thought, and then presenting it to my, the patient that is in front of me in that moment. And then we figure out how to help that one person that is in front of me. So, um, I am in private practice, and uh, in disclosure guidelines, we think that I let you all know that I do own my psychiatry clinic. It's uh, Energy Center for Integrative Psychiatry. I also own uh, an Ayurvedic uh, wellness center uh, and spa. And my kind of integrative medicine is really integrating Ayurveda with psychiatry. And as you all know, uh, the next session that I'm going to talk about is about Ayurveda. And I can uh, hopefully by the end of uh, uh, this morning, you all will be able to see how we can bring all of these different schools of thought together. I am extremely grateful to a few organizations. Uh, besides my education and training in psychiatry both in um, India as well as here, which laid the groundwork. I think I chose psychiatry because of my interest in, uh, in philosophy really. And uh, this, has been, this proved to be the perfect field for, as a physician for me. But I did not know what I was missing until I became a member of Academy of Health and Medicine, AIHM. And this is where I really understood how to understand mental illness from a very broader perspective. Really, mental illness, or for the matter, mental illness, is not in the order that seems to be disease. You know how in family systems we recognize that the symptom bearer is not always the only problem person. It's always within the whole system of the family unit. Uh, in the same manner, when we see mental illness, it's not that the problem is only in the brain. We have to look at all the systems in the body. And this very important insight, um, I received it through my education and I have something to share. So when I first started this, I went there as a psychiatrist and I approached all these big stalwarts in integrative medicine, uh, particularly Patrick Hanley, uh, Dr. Patrick Hanley, who's at, uh, who is functional medicine trained and he's on the board of education for functional medicine. And I kept hounding him at different conferences and I would tell him, look, I don't want to learn how to manage diabetes. I don't want to learn how to fix people's blood pressure. Just tell me how I can use integrative medicine for mental illness. And he, a very, very kind gentleman, he would look at me and say, he would hem and haw, not really give me anything, and say, no, no, come for the next conference, come. And until, I think by the third time I saw him, I realized that I had to give up exactly that mentality. If I really wanted to be effective as a clinician for mental health, then I needed to get out of my comfort zone. I needed to once again learn about every system in the body, not just the nervous system. And uh, I'm grateful for his gentle insight and um, gentle guiding me towards the right path. Uh, he doesn't know it, but I do regard him as a mentor. <laughs> um, and functional medicine, so I've, I'm halfway through my cert, uh, certification training. Um, functional medicine really has uh, given me that, what they've done is that they've operationalized, given hard tools that uh, I, as a clinician, can use in my everyday practice. And they're also wonderful, they have wonderful material which they do allow practitioners of fun functional medicine, their members, to use it um, in presentations like this. Um, the other thing that I did uh, through this whole journey, and this has been a five to six year journey for me now, uh, I became interested in Ayurveda. Uh, I come from India, uh, but that's not the only reason I became interested in Ayurveda. I began to learn the scientific basis and how the idea of holism um, and oneness within us and with outside of us is really important 
for what is ailing all of us today. <clears throat> and um, I did uh, finish my course with Maharishi Ayurveda. Uh, they do have a health professional track and another uh, a course for uh, people who are not in mainstream health uh, uh, fields as well. Uh, and I've been uh, given the permission to use some of these things as well, which uh, I've used for the next talk. So what we're going to do today is really talk about, the first thing I'm going to talk about look, is to look at the existing um, practice when it comes to interventions for children and adults diagnosed with autism and developmental disabilities. Um, you, you'll see that um, in functional medicine and Ayurveda, we don't go by the diagnosis. We go by the dysfunction. So for that matter, because, mainly because of that, although I'm talking about autism mainly in this talk, it is going to be applicable even for, uh, really for any mental illness, but definitely for developmental disabilities. We have to talk about the causes. I think that is the big um, elephant in the room that we don't talk about when it comes to mental illness, autism, even diabetes for that matter. We don't ask the why question. And I've done my little attempt to see if we could have some answers to why uh, children and uh, children end up with autism. And I'm going to talk about the current uh, limitations, um, with the limitations for with the current treatment approaches. Then look at, um, basically describe what I do in my practice, and then we look at what is the research evidence to support what I'm doing. Um, and finally, I have a couple of uh, patient uh, videos, and then maybe if we have time, um, we'll talk about prevention as well. Um, I have shared my slides, and I'm told that they will be available um, on the website. So, you know, you can volunteer what you did there. So, I'm not going to spend too much time into all this. This is just, I just put a slide or two about, we all know it's, uh, you know, autism is now one unified diagnosis. It's autism spectrum disorder. Main thing is persistent deficits in social communication and uh, interaction, restricted, uh, restricted repetitive patterns of behavior in person activities, and this should be present in early development behavior, but it may not become fully manifest until uh, a, person, a child's abilities are overwhelmed by the situation that they're in. Uh, it causes significant impairment in all areas of functioning. Uh, it is not better explained by intellectual disability, although it may coexist, but the deficits in social emotional functioning are much more than what can be explained by the intellectual dysfunction. And, um, and now, ASD is graded on different levels of uh, severity. Level 3 is the most uh, severe, basically meaning that these children and adults require a lot of support from their families, communities, and health professionals to be able to have any quality of life. I don't know why this is not uh, showing properly. I wonder if somebody could tell me to that. It doesn't seem to be sent. Thank you. <laughs> and she's not even on the board. She's <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So with regard to prisoners, this is actually something that we all should pay attention to. But according to uh, Center for Disease Control, right now, um, and this is, uh, the da data is apparently collected every four years, so we are really looking at 2014 data. It's one in 59 children in the U.S. Um, have been diagnosed with having uh, all disease spectrum disorders. And um, so that 2014 survey actually shows a 16% increase compared uh, with 2012. Um, in 2012, it was 1 in 68, uh, but in 2000, it was 1 in 150 children. And then if we go back even more, in the 70s, it was 1 in 5,000. So this graph really shows how things are going up. This is another one which takes into account what was uh, the prevalence in uh, 1975 and now has only till 2009. <coughs> is, I, I don't know, you guys say, is it clear at the back for you guys? What is causing this rate increase? Um, you know, there is definitely increased awareness. We do have 
probably some would say that it's somewhat of a broader criteria, but I would argue that we are getting better at understanding and defining this, whole, this disorder, and that's why we are seeing that even minor symptoms are also being recognized. Uh, there, is, there has been policy changes, rightfully so, because we need to identify early on and also provide the right treatment, and so there is some amount of hope for parents uh, of children with uh, ASD, and so they're also um, you know, seeking treatment early. But nevertheless, these rates have skyrocketed, especially since the 1980s. And uh, yes, most of the research has been looking at the genetic uh, reasons for autism, but really genes don't change that quickly. We have to look at the environment. And when we talk about genes, it's really a very, very small role. I mean, there are certain genetic syndromes which are usually single gene or single chromosome defects. Um, so that, that really begs, it, begs the question, what is it about our environment that is so different now in comparison to maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago? And the reason we need to ask this question is because only when we understand the causes that we can work towards prevention. So um, there is actually a study, it's called uh, Study Tricks for Early Development. They're looking at all the causes, both genetic and environmental. But for some reason, again, most of the focus has been on uh, genetics as of now. Uh, you know, when there's a sibling, one sibling has ASD, others in the family also are high risk. Fragile X, uh, age women, fatability syndromes, these all are uh, genetic syndromes that are associated with ASD. Uh, again, as I said, it's a very small number of patients. So what is the evidence to consider environment. One of the big things is that we know that the perinatal period, so this is not at the formation of the cycle, but really closer to the delivery time, uh, prenatal, uh, during delivery, and po immediate postnatal period. That is the critical period for development of gay uh, autism. Children born to older parents, is it because of aging sperm and ova, more exposure in, in parents to different kinds of environmental toxins? Um, and really looking at all of this, what we're seeing is that Autism is a result of complex gene environment interactions. This is the prevailing theory according to recent research that we not only need to look at the genes but the environment and the way to look at it is that the environment is actually creating changes in how and what genes are being expressed in that person and what genes are not being expressed. So what, what else do you know? If these are just some of the studies that I came across. And, uh, and some of this information, uh, with regard to antidepressants, I was very familiar, but the ones about opiates, I mean, you know how, that was very shocking to me. So basically, uh, this study found that when uh, women who are not pregnant, but they're given opiates, just one prescription, a month's prescription for conditions like low back pain, or headaches, or migraines, that increases the risk for autism spectrum. Valproic acid and thalidomide, you know, valproic acid is a very common medication used to treat bipolar disorder in, uh, in women. And, you know, we all have to, as clinicians, it is imperative that we talk to women about uh, the risk of autism when it comes to uh, pregnancy outcomes. And in all of this research that I even got, the links will take you to the articles that uh, I've found. They, they have actually been published within the last three years. Some of them in 2018. These, uh, what they did in most of these studies is that they not only looked at the incidence of autism, because that was what was happening when they looked at only antidepressants and autism, the numbers were small, so it was somewhat reassuring. But in, in these studies, what they did, they looked at all of the adverse psychiatric outcomes, because we really need to think about any illness as being on the spectrum of health to disease. So autism is also on the spectrum. And when we uh, expand our criteria, what we see is that antidepressants increase risk of many, many different psychiatric illnesses. So it's not just, we, we can't just look at one disease, we have to look at in all the other ways that the brain, this developing brain, is going to misfunction or malfunction. And the last study that I mentioned, they have actually, that's probably one of the best studies because they have compared uh, moms that uh, never were exposed to antidepressants to moms that were exposed to antidepressants before pregnancy, during uh, who started antidepressants during pregnancy and continued it. Um, and the highest risk was actually new uh, treatment with antidepressants during pregnancy. Um, and finally, the study talks about the role of dads. They've actually found an association between antidepressant exposure in dads 
to risk of autism and other psychiatric mm -hmm. outcomes in children. So women, we are not to blame more. <laughs> So, um, and then, uh, you know, this made me think, you know, what are the things that uh, are we doing unknowingly? Um, what about over-the-counter medications that we all, you know, pop in every once in a while? Uh, in fact, uh, even coming, any time, you know, we leave the house, I used to take my Tylenol and ibuprofen, I don't do that anymore, but, uh, you know, we are so used to doing that. What is the effect of all of these uh, medications? Uh, and then since you know, I saw that study on opiates, it made me wonder, what about addiction disorders? Are we looking at addictions in moms and dads as a possible factor for causing um, autism spectrum disorder? And then environmental toxins. Uh, one study that I came across uh, stated that there are about 100,000 new chemicals in the environment here in the U.S. that did not exist uh, before World War II. And none of these chemicals have been studied for their effect uh, on our uh, health. So is that playing a role? Uh, you know, time-wise, there is definitely a correlation. Some of these toxins, they are volatile organic compounds, unfortunately. Even this carpet that we have here uh, could be leaching it into the environment, not to scare you all, but you know, we have to be aware. Awareness is always uh, knowledge, and knowledge is power. Uh, parabens, phthalates, SLE, glyphosate. Glyphosate is Roundup. Uh, there are more and more studies that are coming out about the horrible uh, effects that Roundup has on our uh, genome as well as on our microbiome. And then we are not, uh, studies in, in the beginning, what they were doing is that they were looking at just these isolated uh, chemicals. And by the way, uh, phthalates are present in plastics, parabens in your toothpaste, SLE in your toothpaste, shampoos, soaps. So from the time that we wake up till the moment we go back to bed, there is an onslaught of these chemicals uh, on our bodies, day in and day out. What about the combination of synergistic effects? Because the initial study that they were, that were done, especially uh, in the cosmetics industry, um, was to look at one isolated chemical. But if you look at, go back and take a look at your shampoo, you'll see phthalates, artificial fragrance, parabens, um, and some other things. We don't know what is the synergistic effect and how this is interacting not with our bodies, at the level of the gene. These are some important questions that we need to ask. And, um, and then of course, you know, what about all of these influences in uh, death? And then um, I found this interesting study. Um, what they found is that, uh, this one really focused on Tylenol. I don't know for why they did that, I mean, but it, it, this was again, uh, very, very eye-opening for me. So what they said is that when there is inflammation, oxidative stress. Oxidative stress really means that there is uh, too many oxygen-free radicals that are floating in, in the body, uh, in, in the mom actually. And inflammation can be caused even by chronic stress, you know, that, uh, if it's a single pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy, uh, not having enough uh, the social support, not having financial resources, or even healthcare resources. All of this increases uh, inflammation. And when uh, such a uh, mom is exposed to oxidative stress, which in this article they argue that Tylenol increases that uh, oxidative stress, and that can actually be enough to trigger autism spectrum uh, disorder. So this is kind of a, a table that they show. So inflammatory mediators could be depletion of the microbiome, chronic uh, psychological stress, vitamin D deficiency, inflammatory diets, what we saw yesterday, soybean oil, you know, it's uh, everything, um, Commercial food, especially processed food, does use soybean oil, corn oil, um, as opposed to the healthier fats like olive oil and <coughs> coconut oil and uh, clarified butter. Um, all of these are definitely causing us to be in a heightened inflammatory state. So it takes just one little thing to push uh, a person's health into illness from that point. So really, um, we really have to think about autism as a complicated interaction between genetic predisposition and <coughs> environmental factors, but that there are numerous environmental agents that may be contributing uh, in the etiology of the autism spectrum. I hope I was, I'm not putting you all to sleep, so also to say that Dr. Google can be very, very, very wrong. So I don't think that organic uh, food causes uh, autism. This is just, I, I think somebody was just having a little bit of fun. <laughs> so, um, with that bit of comic relief, let's move on to <laughs> <laughs>
let's move on to treatment uh, of autism spectrum disorders. So when you look at the CDC website, um, the statement is that there is no treatment to cure the four symptoms of autism, but we do have different um, approaches to help the child and their community uh, cope with some of the symptoms, like manage high energy levels, the ability to focus, depression, and seizures. Um, one of the first things that needs to be done is early intervention services, and I think I'm preaching to the choir here, applied behavioral analysis. The goal of this is to teach the child uh, new skills that typically develop during that time frame. And these skills are in the realm of cognitive development, physical development, communication, social, emotional, and adaptive uh, development. Uh, different kinds of uh, approaches are used, behavioral and communication approaches. The main one is applied behavioral analysis. Then there is DIR, a flow time based approach, occupational therapy, uh, physical therapy, sensory integration therapy. But you know, we all know that these children have are difficulties processing sensory information, especially complex information. Sights, sounds, smells, touch, all of this can trigger emotional reactions. And um, these therapies can be very helpful. Speech therapy is, all, is also very much needed. And it's very, very imperative that early diagnosis leads to early treatment because there is more evidence that the sooner we intervene, the better the outcomes are. Dietary approaches, according to CDC, not enough widespread, um, not enough evidence to for widespread recognition. Fully and wholeheartedly disagree with that. Um, the big reason for that is, you know, uh, for clinical research to become everyday practice, it apparently takes 17 years. But here in the age of the information, we should not be taking that long. So what you'll see later on in my presentation, all of the research articles are from 2015 and later. <clears throat> and as, we, as my hope is that that as you take these clinical polls, that you're able to share it with uh, your clients and their families, so that we bring about a real uh, grassroots uh, change. So the definite, I mean, medications, I think this is what, as psychiatrists and physicians, we jump to, unfortunately. Um, so again, there are no medications for the core symptoms, but there are everything that we use in, in psychiatry, every medication from stimulants to antidepressants to antipsychotics, anti-anxiety medications, seizure medications, all of these have been used. Um, complementary and alternative treatments, again, um, according to CDC, they say that the, the evidence is controversial and 10% are frankly harmful. We have to be careful. We, should, we really need to go where the evidence takes us, but we also need to have somewhat of an open mind. So are the treatments working? This study came out in 2015. It was an update uh, of harmful therapy for um, autism spectrum in children and adolescents, and basically their conclusion was that no, it's not really effective, and we also have to be very mindful of the side effect profile of these uh, medications. Um, and they said that it can be pharmacotherapy, it can be part of a comprehensive treatment, um, but they said that we need to have more research and more uh, other ways of thinking. So let's see what, if there's any difference in 2018. Another uh, review about pharmacotherapy just published last year. Again, the conclusions are same. But this article, I felt that they were a little bit more open to complementary and alternative treatments. Now we are seeing that oxytocin is being used, melatonin uh, metabolites are being used. Um, but again, even in this article, there is a little, a little bit more emphasis on the side effect profile of the medications that we use. Especially because we are talking about children sometimes as young as uh, 3 and 5. So what about, I mean, how do we measure whether these interventions are working? So I thought, let's look at quality of life studies in, you know, in, in this population. And unfortunately, I found only one study, which was actually looking at quality of life um, after uh, adult five was given. And they did find that aripiprazole, uh, uh, which is an antipsychotic, that it did seem to positively impact quality of life. But clearly, we need to really focus um, on quality of life measures um, if we are to understand whether what you're doing is working. There is a lot of uh, you know, information and studies about the caregivers, uh, caregiver burden, caregiver quality of life, but the big hole is that there is not enough quality of life for these uh, individuals themselves. So then the next question that can indicate whether what we're doing is working or not is, is you know, how they say follow the money. And what I found is that we are spending an insane amount uh, to the tune of 11.5 billion to 60 billion, and this is 2011 statistic, 
and this includes direct costs, indirect costs, medical expenditure, uh, loss of parental productivity, all of that. And on an average, um, medical expenditures exceed by uh, $4,000 to $6,000 per child per year. Um, in 2005, average medical cost for Medicaid enrolled children uh, with ASD was about $10,000 as opposed to less than $2,000 for a child without ASD. And uh, forty to $60,000 per child per year is, is the expense that we're looking at. <coughs> And keep in mind that this, uh, those uh, economic indicators do not really look at the secondary expense that we have when it comes to managing the side effects of the medications and other interventions that we're doing. So this one looked at a risk of diabetes in children and adolescents exposed to antipsychotics, and they found that there was a significant <coughs> higher, significantly higher risk in uh, uh, in children. I think I read one other study that it found that they didn't. 10 to 15 years, uh, not many of these children are getting diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And then what about the treatment costs, the quality of life from those secondary conditions? So how are we doing so far? We are lost. And like when we are lost, we are lost because we don't know what we are doing. The reason we don't know what we are doing, we really have to go back to the, back to the board and figure out why this is happening. And I would say that it is because we do not have a framework to understand mental illness, uh, including uh, autism spectrum. And this is unfortunately because um, I, what happened, uh, if you look at the history of psychiatry and its uh, development, um, with the invention of chlorpromazine and uh, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, it became an easy fix. It also gave psychiatry a credibility as a valid medical science. Here it was. Just like any other um, field, you can give a pill and the patient feels better. What that did really is that we became too narrow, too narrowly focused on chemical imbalance theory. But now after uh, 50, 60 years, what we are finding is that there is really no evidence to definitively say that yes, in depression there is a serotonin imbalance or an norepinephrine imbalance. That has not been proven. But we don't seem to in psychiatry, you know, in the, before I went into integrative medicine, I, there was somewhat of a, uh, you know, limited options, and limited options definitely engender a state of helplessness and hopelessness. And that is, I, I definitely felt that for some of my patients, possibly communicated that to them unknowingly. But we have, and we really need to have a different approach. And I found this quote to be so, uh, applicable to where we are right now. The great shock of the 20th century science is that systems cannot be understood by analysis of individual parts. We have to look at the whole. The properties of the parts can only be understood by the whole. And this is by Richard uh, Kaplan. So where is the problem? Um, we became, as a medical profession, I think we became um, almost seduced by this notion that there can be a, uh, one pill, there can be a simple pill. And this idea came about with the success of antibiotics, and we thought, hey, you know, that's that's a very, very simple, linear, easy theory. There's an infection, there's a bug, you give an antibiotic. And, but now we know that even that, you know, we are realizing that overuse of antibiotics is, is one of the reasons for a lot of other illnesses. So even in that field, I don't think we got it right. But what we're seeing today, is that there is an explosion of chronic disease, whether it is diabetes, heart disease, or autism spectrum disorder. And in chronic disease, there cannot be just one linear cause. It cannot be a simple cause effect. It's always multifactorial. And when that happens, this simplistic 20th century medicine approach does not apply. So chronic disease is multifactorial, it's complex, and it is invariably lifestyle -related. So how do we approach this chronic disease problem? Uh, this is what I learned from uh, functional medicine and integrative medicine. We have to look at it as there are two basic tenets, two basic principles when it comes to treatment of chronic disease. One, that chronic disease results from the emergence of the disturbed metabolism. So what it means is that the, the body knows the function. And when there is a disturbance in the function of the body, that's when chronic disease results. And lifestyle and environment are the two major factors that alter gene expression. So
So everything is in the context of our genetic material, but the genetic material is also in the context of the environmental influences. So what do we need? We need a new path, a new framework, a new way to think about our health and healthcare. And this is where, so these are, you'll see a few slides. You know, this is from the Institute of Functional Medicine. And I really loved the way they, they encapsulate what it is, what the definition is about. It's about transforming the way we practice and we need a plan for that. Changing the way we do medicine and the medicine we do. Um, functional medicine addresses the underlying causes of disease. So it's not just about symptom management. It's not just about treating the fever. It's going to the underlying symptom. It's not just about treating um, insulin deficiency as in diabetes, but figuring out why there is that insulin. It's not just about treating social, emotional communication problems, it's understanding why that is happening in the first place. And it uses a systems-oriented approach. What it means is that systems refers to the different organ systems here, and we're looking at all of the systems, not just the symptom bearer. And it engages both patient and practitioner in a therapeutic relationship. I call this the medium. And that medium is just as important as everything else can be. The way we connect with our patients has more of an impact with the outcomes than anything else. So it's a new way of thinking and addressing health problems. It is, it, uh, the holistic philosophy of functional medicine actually is heavily influenced and possibly derived from traditional forms of medicine like Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine. So this tree kind of um, this is the functional medicine classic tree. We saw similar things even in um, yesterday's presentation as well. And if you see, um, modern medicine is really just stuck in the branches and in the leaves. That's why we have all of these organ system diagnoses. That's why we have all of these specialities. And But what I learned uh, through this kind of training is that I shouldn't be thinking as a psychiatry specialist. I should be thinking as a super generalist. So that is what I attempt to do. So yes, I mean, they haven't mentioned psychiatry here. Um, but, I, I think I find myself there, but really what I'm doing is that I'm looking at the symptoms that, you know, there is the diseased leaves and the diseased fruit and the flowers, but I'm really going down and looking at these organizing systems. So if you see, functional medicine has also, it's not, they're not, when they do the organ, uh, the systems, they're not talking about gastrointestinal system, respiratory system, they're not, they did not uh, divide the body systems in that manner. They actually went by the function of the system. So when they talk about assimilation here, they have included digestion, absorption, microbiome, and also respiration. So anything that we are absorbing from the environment. So that way they're pulling together two separate systems, the gastrointestinal system and the respiratory system, under one functional category. And then if you see here, defense and repair, it includes the immune system, the inflammatory processes, but also the microbiome from the gut. Um, it, communication includes neurotransmitters, but it also includes hormones. It also includes inflammatory molecules. Again, they're all uh, creating some form of communication. So it really is a completely different way of thinking. We're not going by the anatomical structure within the body and the anatomical division between the different systems, but we're going by the function of each system and how we are putting it all together. And then if you go down even more, uh, the, to the level of the root, what we see is that this is what gives sustenance to the tree. The tree being us, each one of us. It's sleep and relaxation, exercise and movement, I don't know if you're going to talk about that, um, nutrition and hydration, stress and resilience to stress, relationships, um, exposure to trauma or lack of, microorganisms and environmental pollut pollutants. These are the things. And then our own uh, Psychological experiences, you know, our attitudes, our beliefs, um, the emotional experiences that we have, plus the genetic predisposition. But if you see, even below the genetic predisposition, they have actually put in all of these lifestyle and environmental factors. And that is not just a coincidence, it's not an oversight. It is very intentional and very purposeful, indicating that when we change our lifestyle and environment, we can actually change our genetic destiny. This is what gave me hope. These are some of the tools that um, I have used. So when, we, when I listen to any patient's story, I'm thinking in terms of this page here. What are the antecedents, which is the, um, the predisposing factors, any genetic and environmental antecedents? 
<clears throat> what could be the triggering events, the immediate event that led this person to come into my office? And then what are the mediators and the perpetuators, the, the chronic thing? What kind of uh, environment they're living in that is contributing to it? And then, and then every symptom that they tell me, I try to put it into these different organ systems. I'm not just, as a psychiatrist, I probably, in my earlier training, I would probably just have dealt here. And that would happen. You know, I would have been a psychiatrist longer than I've been an integrative uh, psychiatrist. And then my patients would tell me that they're having chronic pain. I would say, yeah, you need to talk to your inter internal medicine doctor. I have thyroid. Yes, I know thyroid causes uh, depression, thyroid diseases. But, you know, that should be addressed with your uh, endocrinologist or your internal medicine doctor. I don't do that anymore. Because because I've gone back, again, out of, outside my comfort zone, and now I know how everything impacts and what I can do through, I'm not actually prescribing any thyroid hormones, I'm not prescribing insulin or any of that. That I'll leave it to the internist still. But just by mediating these lifestyle and environmental factors, uh, in my practice, patients reduce their medications, including not only psychiatric medications, but also um, other medications of their own they are able to reduce it usually by 70 to 80 percent. So if they're on 10 medicines when they start with me, within about six months to a year, they're probably just on one or two. And that there itself, you're eliminating all of that uh, burden because every chemical medicine or every chemical that we get exposed to, our livers and our cells treat it as something that needs to be processed, figured out whether it's good for us or bad, and then if it's bad, to eliminate it. So this happens constantly. This is the other other thing. This is the medical symptom questionnaire, which I've uh, you know, used from. This is something that goes for every patient. You know, before they come into my office, they have to fill out this form. And then, as you see, that it goes through. It, I, I tell them, I, you know, I tell people, this is it's scanning you from head to toe for every symptom that you've experienced. And um, there's the GI system, the joints, muscles. Um, energy activity, mind, emotions, everything. It includes everything that can go wrong with us. And then, as I'm looking at this, I'm again thinking about that, the previous slide that I showed you, the matrix. Which functional system is implicated? What do I need to do? What are the factors that, that are contributing to it? So sometimes, you know, if, when I look at all of these things, I am already, I know what I need to do. But then, the first interview with my patient tells me, how these factors are specifically um, applied to the patient in front of me. So it's not a test, it's not a treatment, it's not about giving supplements, it's really a new way of thinking. It's a new framework, so the same depression symptoms, um, I'm now understanding it with a new framework and there's a new clinical interpretation. So when patients tell me that they cannot wake up in the morning because they're so fatigued and tired, I don't just label it as a symptom of depression. I label it now as probably an energy problem. Um, is it uh, an endocrine problem because the adrenals are implicated? Is it a nutritional deficiency? So all of these things, there, there are so many possibilities and so many avenues of information. Uh, so physiological systems versus diseases. And the other thing is that it really helped me understand that we are all existing on this continuum of optimal function to a state of disease. And uh, with our choices, we are either walking towards the level of health, towards the side of health, or towards the side of disease. It's as simple as that. How empowering it is for a patient to hear that they can actually do something about it and actually bring themselves to a state of health rather than a state of illness. And when you look at it in this framework, you know, the concept of comorbidity becomes, you, it's, it's no longer useful. So I came across a study a few years ago uh, where they said that children that are um, having ADHD are at high risk for cardiovascular diseases when they grow up. So they said you have to look at, you have to monitor the heart, you have to be aware that this comorbidity exists. So no, it's not comorbidity. What we have to see is that the same problem that is resulting in an irritable toxic brain is also affecting the heart, but at different points in time. We have to really look at it happen. And so it follows, if there is no comorbidity, that the causes are the same but manifesting in different organ systems, it follows that when we address the, uh, with treatment, <coughs> you're not only reducing the risk of psychiatric illnesses, you're also reducing the risk of other illnesses and diseases as well. Um, 
So this is a little bit of a repetition, it looks like. <clears throat> but the thing from this slide I want you guys to focus on is that we have two main questions that we need to ask to identify the imbalances, the uh, imbalances in the person. And also that environment in genes. Again, I think you know the reason I put it again, repetition is, you know, it helps with learning. We have to look at the genes as well as the environment. So if you look at the chronic disease, it is multifactorial, it is complex, we have to pay attention to all of this. <clears throat> and the other thing to remember is that the manifestation of these, uh, uh, the way the imbalances manifest is also different. Um, so one condition can have many different causes, but one cause can also result in many different illnesses. So we focus on the matrix, you know, the, the slide that I showed you about the matrix. We look at the patterns and connections between the symptoms and the organs, the functional systems. We find the cause, we focus on creating balance. And we're always focusing on why is this happening rather than what is this disease. And the two questions that we, that I've learned to ask is that, does this person need to be rid of something? Is it something that, is it a toxin? Is it an allergy? Is it an infection or dis, um, a disruption of the microbiome? Is it poor diet or is it stress? And the second question is, does this person have some unmet individual need required for optimal function? And really, these two questions will take us to where we need to go with regard to anybody else. And I also learned that there are only five causes um, for any illness. Toxins, allergens, microbes, stress, and poor diet. Uh, in fact, I came across uh, one of these old, uh, functional medicine doctors say that uh, SAD, it's the acronym for standard American diet. SAD begets SAD, he said. So standard American diet will give you standard American diseases. <clears throat> so what do we need to thrive? We need food. That's the foremost because our body is constantly rebuilding itself. Cells die, new cells are reborn, and they replace the old cells. And what, what the body needs to do this on a constant basis is actually real wholesome food. Proteins, carbs, fats, vitamins, minerals, essential nutrients, uh, all of this. Uh, light, water, and air. There is more and more uh, research showing that uh, spending time in nature is very, very beneficial for us at multiple levels for our mental health, hormonal health, it's just really good. Movement and rhythm, love, relationships, um, community, the connection with one another, connection with the nature around us. And finally, meaning and purpose. We all have to, we all need that. Especially, I mean, I find that this uh, last thing, the meaning and purpose, is severely lacking when patients go through an experience of drug addiction. And um, in withdrawal and in recovery, I focus a lot on helping them find their purpose and, and meaning for their existence. So what we do, and the right order of intervention, we have to start with the more concrete, which is the body, and then the more subtle, which is the mind. And we start with whole, real foods and lifestyle medicine first. And then, fix the gut almost always. Even when you don't know what's going on, go to the gut, figure out if there are any issues there, and fix it. And you will see a lot of change that comes up. And I will actually show you some research that supports this idea. Remove food sensitivities, optimize nutrient status, balance hormones. Again, when I say balance hormones, we are not doing it by giving them an exogenous hormone. We are doing it by cleaning up their system. Detoxification um, is must. I mean, uh, detoxification can be simply by actually changing your diet from uh, conventional produce and conventional meats to organic uh, produce and organic meats. In fact, uh, more studies are showing that within a week, by switching to organic uh, food, levels of pesticides dropped down by almost 60%. So that itself can be a really good first step of detoxification. <clears throat> and then there is the 4R protocol with regard to that. So in functional medicine, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, the focus is really on healing the gut. The good reason. The first thing would be to remove the foods that are <coughs> causing the problem. A lot of uh, children uh, and adults with ASD and mental illness have food sensitivities. So remove those foods, then we replenish with the nutrients that are missing. So uh, appropriate lab tests are uh, necessary to figure out 
Um, you know, yesterday we learned about fatty acids, but there's also vitamin D, vitamin B12, um, other kinds of nutrients like iodine. I, I think um, Dr. Joe also mentioned about uh, the role of iodine in IQ. But iodine, iron levels, ferritin levels, there's so many things that now with uh, modern lab uh, labs we're able to assess and also implement. Repair the gut lining. So the gut lining is, uh, so this involves the light, you know, single cell intestinal cell that lines the uh, small intestines as well as the colon. But this single cell is probably the most important um, cell in the whole body because it creates the internal barrier. Everything that we eat stays in the, in the hollow lumen of the intestine and can only enter the bloodstream if the cell says it is okay to do it. But We'll see, we see that in whenever there are food sensitivities and allergies, this lining becomes broken down and allows all kinds of garbage to enter our system through the blood. So we have to repair the gut lining. And two things that the gut cells need um, is butyrate, which is found plenty in uh, uh, clarified butter, uh, also known as ghee. And the other one is L-butamine, which is a product of collagen. So these are the two main nutrients that will, uh, within a month, uh, the patients will report improvement in their symptoms. And then finally, we inoculate with gut bacteria. So yesterday when I was hearing that there are not enough studies that show benefits of using probiotics, it's because we have to get the soil ready first. It's the same analogy. You have to first work with the soil, you have to work with the environment, and then finally when you introduce gut bacteria in the form of probiotics or probiotic-rich foods, that's when we see improvements. So I'm not really that fond of these uh, randomized control trials where they just take one intervention and think about creating a whole change. It doesn't work. You have to think in terms of systems. <clears throat> but to do this whole thing, it doesn't lend itself very well to randomized control trials. So there's, there's a little bit of that. But having said that, um, occasionally we do see some positive results even in using um, probiotics as well. <coughs> So just to kind of go over, um, so can this, everything that I talked about in functional medicine, you know, that was my question. How do I apply it in terms of psychiatry and mental illness? <clears throat> and what I learned is that it is very much applicable. This is what I do day in and day out. And, and also, it makes sense to me that what we think of as diseases, like you know, depression, anxiety, um, autism, they, those are just uh, constructs that we have created to understand the breakdown of function. But the bo our bodies are not going, oh, I'm going to manifest diabetes in this person, or I'm going to manifest depression or high blood pressure. That's not how it goes. The body is always trying to maintain its balance. But when our lifestyle and our choices are going against the balance, in the beginning, the, the body still tries to compensate. And that compen as a result of that compensation, we do see symptoms. When the imbalance is mild, compensation is complete, body goes back into balance. But when either the, the lifestyle is not changing or the imbalance keeps on building up, that's when we go into what we identify as this disease stage. <clears throat> so symptoms are really either a result of the compensation response or the manifestation of the, uh, of the breakdown in function. And it is also um, a communication system that alerts us that something is wrong. So when, when we injure ourselves, there is pain. And what we do when there is pain is we don't use that part of the body as much. We allow for rest and repair to happen. Anxiety or depression, these are all symptoms of the mind that invite us to take, to take a pause and to see what is going on that is making us feel this way. So it's not to be always medicated and suppressed away. We really need to work with it, which, you know, as therapists, whether it is cognitive behavior therapy or psychodynamic therapy, that is what we're doing. We're trying to understand why the depression or anxiety is manifesting. And as I said, health and sickness are on a continuum. And each one of, you know, we all have our biological individuality. That is what determines why one person may have the same uh, underlying imbalance. For, I've given the example of methylation gene, the foremost is MTHFR gene. So this gene in one person can cause autism, and in another person it can cause celiac disease, in a third person it can manifest as cancer, in a fourth person it can manifest as stroke. All of these different, dis seemingly different diseases can all be linked to one um,
cause, which is um, a defect in the MTHFR gene. And why that happens is because, again, from the time that we are, probably from the time our life starts as a single cell cycle, the environmental influences are constantly interacting with our genes. So it's the social environment, the physical environment, nutritional environment, emotional environment, everything. <laughs> So we recognize in integrative medicine a lot of importance is given to the innate healing power of the organism. We all have that, that what I meant the, said as the homeostatic or homeodynamic mechanism, that is actually our innate healing abilities. I mean, even if you, if, let's say you, you burn a little bit with, while cooking or you have a little cut, you don't have to really do anything. The repair process will start off immediately. And it can happen in a larger scale as well. And we look at the whole person. You know, it's, it's about not what disease we are treating, but it is about the person who has this disease. And when you look at the whole person, especially in psychiatry, you're looking at not just at the brain, but below the neck as well. And recognize the importance of lifestyle. And, like I said, the medium, the doctor-patient relationship. This is how we create change and remain change. So we figure out how everything is connected. Education uh, about all of these factors to the patient is very, very important. It's a 50-50 collaboration. So I don't ever tell anybody, you have to do this. You have to follow my recommendations. I provide the rationale. And when it makes sense, it may make sense, right? I mean, like I had this uh, lady in her 50s who's coming to me for alcohol dependency. She has gut issues, microbiome. So she was all willing to change all of that. And of course, give up alcohol too. But then I also said that the hair dye that she's using is also contributing to some of the information that she's had. So she said, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. I said, sure, I, this is the information that I'm giving you. You decide what it is that you want to implement. And, and I'm here to educate you, but you know, you have to make those choices for yourself. <clears throat> and then we trace our step, steps back towards health, uh, and vitality and self-care and resilience. So, uh, and, and this is also important, you know, I take only half of the responsibility for getting somebody to get better. Uh, and this works, I mean, uh, the two patient videos that I have to share with you, uh, they are adults with autism and they are taking responsibility for their own self-care, for their own health. <clears throat> so human mind-body system, it's a complex web of interconnection. I know I seem to be repeating some of this a lot because I really want to emphasize that we cannot just go by each organ system. We have to look at the whole person, all of the organ systems and the functional systems. And when you correct, when we evaluate and correct the imbalances in all of these systems, we will find better health and vitality. So now let's take a look at, this is probably the meat of my talk. Can we get a little technical, um, so bear with me here a little. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is about the methylation genes and the homocysteine uh, metabolism. <clears throat> the main one is MTHFR and uh, uh, other single nucleotide polymorphisms. So this is the different kinds of uh, chemical reactions that are happening within our cells. And um, now don't, uh, the only thing I want you to focus on is these terms here, MTHFR, and then there is the uh, 5 methylfolate, which is basically B9 vitamin. And then here we have cobalamin cycle, which is the B12. Uh, and here if you see all of the neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. And if you come over to this side, you'll see that when there is a pathway for neuronal damage and microbial activation. Um, so microglia, are, these are the inflammatory cells in the brain. They get activated whenever there is a, a trigger for them. Um, and that these triggers for the, the inflammation to happen could, uh, could be because of imbalances in these different uh, chemical reactions that are happening. And every reaction, there are the things in the boxes, these are all the different genes. So there can be um, defects in many of these genes that can result in both oxidative stress as well as um, inflammation. So is it and how do we fix a genetic defect? It really, what, what we do in treatment is that we are giving, we are bypassing these genes. 
So here, um, what this MTHFR does, I'll just give you one example, is that it takes the uh, dietary folate, which is in the form of folic acid, and converts it into methyl folate here, 5 methyl THF. That is the function of MTHFR. So when this gene is blocked or not functioning, what we do is that we give that methyl folate. And then, just by simply changing one nutrient, we are able to completely change how this person's cells are functioning, how their tissues are functioning. It'll take a little bit of time, but we can definitely do that. <clears throat> so then, so again, you know, is it nature or is it nurture? It's important. Genes are only the blueprint. Environment provides the building blocks, and this happens on a continuous process. So, you know, that's why it also explains why, although these genes are present since birth, it doesn't have to manifest until a certain age is reached. It's because, again, things in the environment, when they change, and when enough bad things happen, that's when we see the disease. So what about genetic diseases like Fragile X and Angelman and Predability syndromes? These are very isolated gene defects. So how do we, I mean, they, in these kinds of illnesses, there is really nothing that we can do to uh, change the gene or its effect itself. But even in these conditions, what I would do is I would go, go to the matrix that I showed, look at what are the physiological systems that are not functioning, and then look at how we can change the, their lifestyle and environment to optimize their functioning. Even by doing that, of course, we are not curing anybody of these genetic diseases, but quality of life will improve, symptoms will reduce, reliance on other medications will come down. So what do we know about genes and epigenetics? Epigenetics is this concept that everything in our environment changes how and what genes are expressed or not expressed. So earlier what we were thinking, there is one gene that results in a bad protein and that bad protein results in a disease. That doesn't apply anymore. So all of the factors that influence the expression of genes, whether it is food, our internal environment, external environment, immediate distant environment, these are all the things that can change which genes we are expressing and which genes we are not expressing. So exposome, again, uh, this uh, encapsulates the sum total of all of the environmental toxins that we are exposed and how that is impacting our genetic genetics. Nutrigeno, the same concept as it is applied to nutrients, uh, the effect of nutrients or the lack thereof, thereof uh, when on our genome and how it is expressed. So food as medicine, um, and let's see whether we can actually create this epigenetic influence on uh, just by using food. As we discussed, there are macronutrients, carbs, fats, and proteins. All of them are important. Micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, uh, antioxidants, phytonutrients, these are also just as important. And food is, you know, they are the, that's what gives us the building blocks uh, to create, make our new cells, new tissues, new organs, um, all the time. And they're, they're also mediators of our human experience. What do I mean by that? So why is it that we have turkey for Thanksgiving or cookies for Christmas? You know, there are uh, lamb for Easter. I learned about this recently. So why is it, why do we have these kind of associations? Because it is through food that uh, you know we have created. Uh, there's a cultural experience associated with it. There is an emotional memory that is associated with it. You know, so the smells of certain foods take me back right to childhood. Good memories and bad memories with certain foods that I absolutely hated. But there is both of that. You know, food is memory. It creates connection. You know, when you share an, uh, a meal with uh, other people, I mean, even if it is for the first time that you're meet, sitting down together for a meeting and having a meal, it, it creates that connection between all of us. It is memory and it is, as I said, it is an epigenetic influence. This is nutrition and food are the one thing that constantly upgrade or downgrade our biological software, which is our, our genome. And how does it do it? I've given you one example with regard to vitamin D. Vitamin D actually, uh, it binds to more than 2,700 genes and uh, regulates the expression of more than 200 of them. It acts in many, many ways. It helps with neuronal differentiation, connection between the different axons. In, in that manner, it can actually change even how your brain can look anatomically, uh, simply by the absence or presence of this one. 
Um, it also helps with the serotonin levels in the brain. Again, that's, this is how vitamin D um, has also been implicated in uh, the social emotional dysfunction that we see with autism spectrum children. Um, studies with AS, children with ASD has also shown that when you give vitamin D and oxytocin, there is an improvement in that realm, in the social emotional realm as well. Uh, it up, up regulates DNA repair genes um, and it reduces inflammation molecules. Vitamin D deficiency during pregnancy is linked with um, intrauterine growth retardation and um, autism spectrum illness. Again, a very, very simple intervention. It's cheap, it's available, it doesn't taste bad. Something that we can do, we can easily monitor blood levels and make sure that everyone is getting the right amount. Uh, I won't spend too much time on omega-3 fatty acids, but again, omega-3 fatty acids in combination with vitamin D or alone are also associated with reduced risk of uh, autism, mentally better women. Uh, pregnant women as well as uh, children with autism spectrum disorder, they also show benefits in behaviors, in social emotional connection. All of those things improves with uh, supplementation with these, uh, with these uh, nutrients. I was actually waiting for this slide. I thought this was earlier on. So here, this is a very, very definitive evidence. Uh, this is a study that, was, that came out of China. It was published in the Journal of Cell Research. So what they found is that uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese people, they eat a lot of rice, and they found the microRNA, the genetic material of rice, they found it floating in the blood of their subjects. And that completely, and this was, I mean, I was shocked when I saw this study. This blew my mind. Is, is there, I mean, if we need any more evidence that the genetic material of the food that we are eating has a direct influence, is talking to our genes. It's actually called cross-kingdom talk. You know, from the plant kingdom to the animal kingdom, this is actually happening. And uh, in, in this instance, they, they found that um, uh, this rice MRNA, uh, messenger RNA, was actually uh, uh, down-regulating the removal of LDL, which is low-density lipoprotein, the bad cholesterol, from the blood. So when they, uh, and what they did, they actually did a treatment here. They gave uh, some kind of an intervention which turned off the messenger RNA, and then they found that the low-density lipoprotein was once again being cleared from the from the blood. So these are the ways that what we eat three times a day, what we put inside our bodies, can upgrade or downgrade our genome. And it's not just the nutritive or caloric value. <coughs> so next we'll move on to inflammation. I've already shown you how there are studies that are linking the presence of inflammation in mothers. Uh, to increase risk of autism. What we have seen, uh, what we have seen is that. So, what is the evidence to say that there is inflammation? These are all the uh, molecules, the inflammatory molecules that they have done uh, autopsy studies and also certain lab tests. They found that uh, in autism spectrum there is an increased presence of microglia. These are the inflammatory cells in the brain. Um, these uh, seem to increase in key areas of the brain, like the frontal lobe, anterior cingulate cerebellum uh, in other structures as well. The pro-inflammatory cytokines, yesterday we saw that uh, arachidonic acid, you know, the, the bad oil, soybean oil, omega-6, that increases arachidonic acid and the uh, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines or the chemical messengers, that are definitely increased in autism spectrum. There is also an activation of T lymphocytes, uh, which are the uh, the cells, the macrophages and other, uh, other uh, cells that actually create a cellular immune response. But there is also activation of B cells, which, in, which is responsible for different uh, formation of different antibodies. Uh, and there is a reduction in levels of um, anti-inflammatory chemical messengers like interleukin 10. Uh, chemokines are smaller molecules than the interleukins uh, and the cytokines, but they also have different, um, they regulate the immune system just as much as the uh, interleukins and the cytokines do. And we find that in autism spectrum children, there is a dysregulation of chemokines. And there are studies that have shown that when there is immune activation in the mom, as well as microbiome disruption in the mom, that has been associated with fetal brain abnormalities and uh, autism spectrum. Um, another easy test we could be doing for all uh, pregnant women is to look at CRP levels. That is um, C-reactive protein, which is a marker for inflammation. And elevated CRP, uh, even type 2 diabetes, these are all inflammatory states. 
that has been linked with uh, risk for long term. So as I'm showing this, what we need to think about is that every point that I'm making here in terms of inflammation or MTHFR gene, these are all the points where we can intervene to really prevent the occurrence of autism. And in this slide, this was an interesting article for me to read, where they're actually showing similarities between autism spectrum and schizophrenia. And what they're again talking about is immune dysfunction, uh, inflammation in the brain, microbial uh, activation, oxidative stress, uh, causes problems in neurodevelopment um, and um, results in these two very separate syndromes. But again, going by the concept of the continuum concept where everything is just, a, it's, it's a degree, it's a separation by degrees. So the, whatever I'm talking about in terms of autism can also be applied to schizophrenia and I would say for depression and anxiety as well. So again, I do want to emphasize that the toxins that we are exposed to, they are the number one triggers for activating our immune system. And I found, so you might wonder why um, there's an article about environmental toxins and uh, allergy mm -hmm. inflammation, then I've also had environmental toxins, inflammation, and cancer. Because how these toxins affect us is by triggering our immune system. And it does a bunch of things, and these are, you know, cigarette smoke, um, EDC stand for endocrine disrupting chemicals, which is uh, parabens, as I mentioned, phthalates, uh, even BPA, uh, you know, the BPA, the lining of the inside of the plastic bottles, uh, that is also an endocrine disruptor. So when, what they mean by endocrine disruption is that these, all of these molecules, they look like estrogen and confuses our body. They act, they bind to estrogen receptors in our body. Um, studies have actually shown that there is feminization of uh, of, of men and uh, male fetuses happening because of exposure to these uh, uh, toxins. Atrazine is also, it's a pesticide, glyphosate is also a pesticide, but atrazine and, uh, is specifically also um, acts like an endocrine disruptor. Uh, so what do they do? They change our immune system and they don't do it in a good way. They actually increase risk for allergies and hypersensitivity. They increase in, uh, autoimmunity. And how they do that is that these uh, toxin molecules, they bind to different uh, natural proteins like albumin. And then that altered albumin molecule now triggers the immune system because it looks different to our immune cells. And the immune cell system is thinking, what is this? This is a different thing. We need to attack it. So that's, what, that's how even autoimmunity, we are, uh, some studies say that um, autoimmunity has gone up by 400% in the last two decades. Toxins, again, can explain that. So while the immune system is raging in this uncontrollable fashion, what naturally happens is that it's not able to do what it should do, which is protect us from infections. So again, you'll see in your, in your clients that they get sick with everything, every cold, every fever, you know, they're falling sick, and that gets ex they get exposed to more medications and treatment. <clears throat> so they're also known to cause cancer, again, by the same, all of these medications. Um, they have, I also found studies where they show that these chemicals disrupt the gut line and cause leaky gut. So my question is, why not autism? So if it is triggering inflammation in all these different systems, there's clear, it, it is very much triggering inflammation in the brain as well. So again, I'm making a case that we really have to make an effort to minimize use of um, these kinds of products. Next, we move on to the role of gut and the microbiome and for um, in autism. So we know that um, um, more than 91% of children with autism spectrum illnesses have uh, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. This can be in the form of uh, actually colic uh, in babies. Uh, that is one of the signs of gastrointestinal dysfunction. Um, colicky baby, poor sleep, all of this is tied into that. But as they grow older, we see uh, food sensitivities, extreme food pickiness. You know, we all know that most of these children, they stick to just one type of food, typically the white foods. Um, they are constipated, they have diarrhea. Um, these are some of the things, and it's, it affects almost 91% of uh, children. And again, you know, we don't know whether it's the gut issues that cause the brain problems or the brain issues, but most likely it is a common cause that is resulting in both brain abnormalities as well as the gut health issues. And with regard to the microbiome, what we find in uh, children with ASD, uh, ASD is that 
the microbiome was less diverse. In on the whole, um, we are, uh, you know, when we compare the microbiome in the industrial world versus microbiome in uh, indigenous and original cultures, there is very less diversity in the industrial world as compared to the, the Bushmen of Australia or the Amazon tribes. Even compared with 100 years ago, the number of uh, different microbial species has gone down significantly. And this is because of, again, you know, uh, we could blame the toxins, we can blame overuse of antibiotics, as well as more C-sections happening now. Because the birth canal is how the sterile baby is seeded with the, the vaginal flora. And then imagine if, if the mom gets antibiotics during pregnancy, for whatever reason. So we really have to think about the unintended consequences of every action, every decision that we are making, both as physicians as well as consumers of them. Okay. <clears throat> um, these children have more of a bad species, which is Clostridium, Bacteroides species, and uh, the sulfobium rio. These are some of the studies I've looked at this. We don't know the whole story, but these are some of the bad actors that are coming up. And the metabolites from these bad bacteria, one of them is propionic acid, uh, has been linked directly to um, autism spectrum behaviors. So the microbiome has many, many different functions. One of them is to, uh, the metabolites of these bacteria, a big one is butyrate, which is also present in ghee, but many of the good bacteria also make butyrate, which is then used by the intestinal cells for energy. But when instead of butyrate, when more of the propionic acid is made, that gets transferred to the brain, and that results in autism that we use. LPS is another toxin released by many of these pathogenic gram-negative bacteria, and it, LPS stands for lipopolysaccharide. Um, and this LPS has been linked to not only emotional disturbances, but also disorders like depression and anxiety as well. And again, the problem with this is that there could be a lot of LPS or propionic acid floating in the blood, but you're not going to see fever. You're not going to see other symptoms that we as commonly associate with infections. And it is also these, the microbiome destruction has been shown to be more common in the regressive type of autism. So regressive type wherein a child is developing normally or seemingly normal and then suddenly symptoms develop, um, uh, autism symptoms develop. These children, it has been found that right before the onset of autism symptoms, they have some kind of a gastrointestinal event. Um, and then we, the, the microbiome destruction is more common in these children. Again, exciting information. How can we prevent? How can we recognize? And how can we intervene? <clears throat> so leaky gut. So you know, I've referenced to this uh, a couple of times now. It really is that we have the single cell of intestine um, cells lining the intestine as well as the colon, and it has a number of functions. The main one is to make the digestive enzymes to digest the food that we are eating. Then it also um, has. These, uh, the second important function is absorption of the nutrients. And the way it does is by these gap junctions, they are called uh, tight junctions. They're normally very tightly interlinked like this. So only when uh, the cell is recognizing that there is a food particle that needs to enter, it will open up slightly and only completely digested food. So if you're eating a protein, it needs to be digested into amino acids. Only those amino acids enter. If it is carbs that you have eaten, then it, the, the sugars, uh, the simple sugars, they enter. So fats, the fatty acids, they enter. But intact, undigested food should not be entering, especially undigested protein. But what happens in leaky gut because of all the things that we talked about, stress, toxins, pathogens, lipopolysaccharide, and even just chronic indigestion, undigested food particles gets putrefied by the bacteria. And that, yes, <laughs> I can see some, <laughs> yeah, that putrefied material, food material, then triggers, one, it creates more disruption of the microbiome, but it also causes uh, damage to the intestinal cells. So now you don't have to depend on the tight junctions. This, the cells become leaky, and they allow all of these undigested food, especially undigested protein, to enter the bloodstream here, and any protein, any foreign protein, triggers an immune reaction. So that is why, you know, when the cells are intact, we eat protein, we eat animal protein, and we don't develop any problems to it. But when, the, when there is leaky gut, the same undigested protein can trigger different kinds of reactions.
You are a lifesaver today. <laughs> So then, what are the effects of the leaky gut? Leaky gut has been shown to be the cause for literally all diseases. So when I said earlier, when in doubt, feel the gut first, this is why. And this information is not new information. This is really old wine and new wine. Because Chinese medicine, Indian medicine, most traditional forms of medicine, they have recognized this. In fact, in Ayurveda, the term for the toxins is armor. That when that, uh, it's basically the information that is triggered by what we talked about in the leaky gut uh, slide. That uh, information is actually called as AMA, and AMA has the propensity to travel everywhere with the blood flow. And wherever AMA settles, wherever this information settles, that uh, tissue, that organ will manifest symptoms. So it can cause, when, the, uh, when this inflammation is within the gut itself, it can cause inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, IBS, all of this can happen. <clears throat> but when it reaches the skin, acne, rosacea, eczema, psoriasis can happen. In the brain, it's been associated with um, depression, anxiety, autism, ADHD, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease also, that we are now seeing studies that show that Parkinson's is also coming from the gut and it's this process that is happening. Uh, frequent colds, food sensitivities, these are all the things that can happen. And in joints, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, uh, endocrine diseases like thyroid, Hashimoto's, uh, Graves disease, all of this autoimmunity, uh, SME is linked to leaky gut, uh, anything, I mean, Jogren syndrome, any autoimmunity that you can think of is really coming from uh, leaky gut. So what is the evidence for leaky gut? This is again a very new study just published uh, last year. Um, and this was a specific study looking about this concept of leaky gut and autism spectrum. And what they found is that children on the autism spectrum have what they call as the fragile gut. So they may not have symptoms all the time, but any little event, any little stress can push them to have symptoms like what we saw constipation, diarrhea, all of those kinds of symptoms. Cramping, uh, you know, the kids come complain of stomach pain. <laughs> um, and what we see, uh, this, uh, the mood and behavior is also intimately connected to this fragile gut. And what they found in these children is that there is a low digestive enzyme activity, the gut barrier integrity causing undigested dietary peptides to enter the bloodstream. This is what they basically found. Um, antibodies specific for dietary proteins in the peripheral circulation. So if, if you're having antibodies to the food proteins, where is it coming from? It has to come through the gut. And a subset of uh, children with ASD, they have high concentrations of uh, metabolites originating from mi microbial activity on protein substrates. So when we talked about propionic acid, that is what uh, they're talking about. They found uh, that these children have high levels of propionic acid. Um, and there is evidence that uh, gut dysfunction and dysbiosis directly causes different core symptoms of ASD. So we're not talking about just of the secondary symptoms, but the core symptoms, whether it is um, uh, sort of the, you know, the repetitive stereotypical activities, loss of eye contact, all of these core symptoms can actually be mediated by this gut dysfunction and dysbiosis. So more articles linking intestinal permeability, environmental toxins. In this case, they've looked at artificially processed food. Um, and um, they've actually shown that glutamine, as I mentioned, glutamine, uh, which is uh, an amino acid that is derived from collagen, uh, is very, very essential for repairing the gut line. I think I've already mentioned this. This is an article where they showed that uh, foreign toxins bind to human proteins like the albumin protein and then they are able to trigger an inflammation response. <clears throat> so to recap about the gut, this is Dr. Alicio Fasano, he's a pediatric gastroenterologist. He's the one that has studied extensively about celiac disease and also non-celiac gluten sensitivity and basically this is what he has to say.
gut is not like Vegas. <laughs> what happens in the gut does not stay there. <laughs> so I know that you got the message shot. <laughs> so then, let's look at the microbiome and uh, our gut. So really, you know, we, are, uh, we share about, uh, um, what is it? We have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes and Drosophila has 22 pairs of chromosomes. And when you look at our genome, there are only about 26,600 protein encoders, genes, that are uniquely human. But we have over 2 million uh, gene uh, combinations. And um, why is this? I mean, we have less, and in fact, rice has 50,000 protein uh, encoders or protein uh, or genes. So we have less amount of genetic material that is uniquely human, but we are the most complex species on this planet. And this is because uh, one theory is that it is because of the genome of thousands of uh, species that reside in our gut. We are outnumbered by bacterial cells by 1 to 10. So for every human cell, there are 10 bacterial cells. And these bacteria, they live in our gut. Most of it is in the gut. It's, uh, there are about 3 kilos of bacteria in the gut. But we also have them in our respiratory tract, in the genitourinary tract, on the skin, in the hair, everywhere. And the functions, the main function is that they regulate both our metabolism as well as our immune system. So when a child is born naturally through the birth canal, the child gets seeded with uh, the bacteria, and that bacteria then slowly trains this very, very fresh immune system in figuring out who is a friend and who is a foe. That important function happens within the uh, first year. Um, they modulate gene expression. There are many studies that show that uh, the kind of uh, bacteria that we have, the good bacteria actually make us feel more optimistic, the bad bacteria make us feel pessimistic and hopeless. Um, they play an important role in uh, brain and behavior development, as we have seen, both in children with autism, and you know, uh, applies that when there is a healthy microbiome, there is uh, more normal behavior. They also, and in terms of neurotransmitters, they make GABA, which is the inhibitory uh, uh, amino acid, so whenever there is enough GABA floating that may, keeps us calm and collected, it's, so we, I do use GABA as a supplement for anxiety as well. And BDN, it stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So whenever there is repair and regeneration, we need BDN. Some antipsychotics like uh, aripiprazole and olanzapine also seem to increase BDN levels. But the microbiome can do that without making you 20 pounds overweight. <coughs> Um, so as we saw, you know, bacterial toxins, you know, we talked about LPS, we talked about propionic acid. Um, when there is the bad bacteria, all these toxins, they do create change in behavior, mood, and even specific illnesses like pandas, uh, schizophrenia, autism, Parkinson's disease, dementia, multiple sclerosis, all of these conditions are linked. There is a beneficial role, like, again, like I said, I, you cannot just give the probiotics and expect those bugs to do all the work for you. You have to make sure that they are able to survive in your gut. And oral, but there is a study that found that uh, giving oral probiotics to pregnant women and did reduce risk of ASD. Um, but how about, I mean, we, how about we actually provide, create an environment for, this, for pregnant moms where the microbiome disruption is not happening in the hospital? So that would be a better way of going about it. So my, the microbiome has been called the endangered species because, again, less microbial diversity even in comparison to 100 years ago. Uh, the nature of the microbiome with more bad pathogenic bacteria, we are really losing this. We need to be very mindful of taking care of these little bugs that live in, in, inside of us. They are not happy. So, can we cure ASD? I, I think we can definitely prevent. Are we there where we can say that we can cure autism spectrum illness? Some animal studies are very, very promising. This uh, uh, article came out of uh, Israel, and I thought I should share this with you all because uh, with the intention of you know making us all feel hopeful and making us recognize that there are ways that we can um, make significant changes in the lives of our clients. Um, so this is a complete contrast to what uh, CDC says, but there is some evidence that uh, you know that most of the studies have been done in mice. 
uh, these animal models definitely show that when intervened early with the right kind of uh, intervention, some of the causes of behaviors were completely gone. So what they used was antioxidants. They used oxytocin uh, SAMPE, which is s adenosine again related to the MTHFR cycle. Uh, they've also used melatonin modulator stimulants. Um, but bottom line with all of these interventions is that they were focusing on reducing inflammation and oxidative stress. So whenever there are too many free oxygen radicals and when there is inflammation, we need to reduce that. So it is a complex illness, but it is happening because of gene and environment interaction at critical periods of brain development that results in, what, in a syndrome what we call as ASC. And we fix, we can attempt to fix these physiological imbalances. And this is kind of the protocol that I use. So anti-inflammatory diet. Remove gluten and dairy. These are the most uh, inflammatory diets. <coughs> All exposure to toxicants. So complete absence of processed food. So when I say don't give gluten and dairy, um, recently one mom decided to bring in a lot of so-called gluten-free processed food. No, that's not what we need to do. We need to give real food, homemade, uh, with as little ingredients, ingre <coughs> ingredients that we recognize. And high nutrient dense diet. A lot of fish oil, vitamin D, and depending on individual uh, scenarios, there are some other nutrients that I would recommend. I always do a genetic test to look at the methylation genes, and based on the profile that I see, I will give either SAMe or methylfolate or methyl B12. These are some of the and glutathione. These are some of the things that I will give. Um, and finally, botanical medicine. So the big advantage to using Ayurveda in my practice is that it's given me um, an exposure to wonderful herbs and formulations that are derived from nature. And the thing between herbs and chemical medicines is that we share common genetics with the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. And there can be this cross kingdom talk. It, and we make use of that ability for these, uh, for the genetic material in the herbs to speak to our genome in a beneficial manner and to modulate how we function. And always, uh, never forget the meeting. It always happens in the context of the patient physician relationship. So just wanted to share, do we have some time? Quickly I'll just go over the patient scenarios. So Katie is a 25 year old uh, young woman with uh, who was diagnosed with autism spectrum illness and I've been working with her since July 2018. The reason she was brought to me is that she was at a supported uh, uh, housing, she was in a supported housing situation and her behaviors were escalating very bad. She was becoming aggressive, mainly verbally, but threatening to kill her caregivers, threatening to punch them, beat them. Those instances were very rare. So right away told me that she's Aggressive, she's irritable for some reason, but she's having enough wherewithal to not really carry out her actions. Um, a lot of inappropriate behaviors, uh, flirting, uh, she loved for the cops to be called on her, and then she would flirt with the cops. And that, you know, so they, the cops in that area really come and got to know her, and I, I think they somehow tried to mitigate because they stopped taking her to the hospital every single time. They were able to contain some of those behaviors, but you know, if it's happening in the middle of the night, talk about you know what was happening to the caregivers in that system. She had near total insomnia. She would barely sleep for two to three hours, and she was complaining of severe anxiety. And very tough to care for the uh, the uh, the uh, case managers and the caregivers at the supported housing wanted her family to take a bath. <coughs> And of course, she came there because she was having some of those behaviors even at home. So she frequent visits to the ER, and uh, as I mentioned, and she hasn't been somehow. She didn't get hospitalized, and she was on treatment. Uh, she was on a variety of plants. She was on uh, quetiapine, uh, up to 300 milligrams per day. Lamotrigine, also I think 250 to 300 milligrams. She was on ox carbazine, another mood stabilizer and uh, cetrazine for allergies. Uh, these are all the medications that she was taking. And uh, oxcarbazine was also uh, 600 milligrams, uh, 300 milligrams twice daily. So pretty high doses of all of these medications. And the previous psychiatrist was trying to manage the medicines. She went up, she started with Cerebral, was going up and up on that. 
It wasn't working. She was just getting worse. And she had gained over 70 pounds with all these men changes. <clears throat> so she wasn't happy about it. She was chronically constipated. She had all the signs of gut inflammation and the leaky gut. So then, um, so she was, yeah, she was actually getting more quetiapine than was uh, prescribed for her. Uh, the previous physician gave it as a prescription, regular dosage, but also as a, uh, a, a PRL medication, and she was maxing out on the PRLs. So, but what I found really was that she had a condition known as blepharospasm. And uh, blepharospasm is this involuntary movement disorder that is a result of antipsychotics that affects the eyes. So her eyes were going like this. She could not control it. And it is extremely annoying, extremely irritating. So I'm looking at her, if I see her for the first time, she's not psychotic. I mean, she's able to tell me what's happening. She's, I could connect with her. There's no delusions, no hallucinations. But I see her eyes going. And I thought she was doing it on purpose. She said, no, this has been happening, and this is terribly annoying to me. So then I figured that she was, this irritability was, and the blepharospasm is really coming from the antipsychotic, but I've been in this case. So making, having made that hypothesis, what I said is that we need to get you off of that. So I gave her a little bit of clonazepam and began to take down. Within a couple of weeks, the blood spasm went down, but her insomnia, anxiety, and everything still persisted. Again, in this situation, what I felt was that her, all of this, she was really becoming toxic on all the medications that she was on. And her behaviors really had meaning to them. So the big thing that happened, she was doing well at home. She was uh, not, she didn't have any behavioral problems or any of those issues until she was 17. Um, she also has cognitive uh, disability too, so she was in special education. She was getting all the services and life was going on well. But at age 17, one fine morning, she decides to take her sister's car, doesn't know to drive, takes it out somehow and totals it. And then after that point in time, uh, is when all these behaviors began to escalate. She became very oppositional, angry, aggressive, and all of that. But in my work with her, what I realized is that she comes from a family of high achievers. Dad is Harvard educated, older brother is Yale educated, one sister is Cornell educated, another sister is also either Harvard or Yale. I, I forget which. So that 17, she saw that it happened, that incident happened when her younger sister actually was uh, on her way to being accepted to Cornell. That's what that's what we did. And for all these years, so almost eight years, this information did not come out because I think nobody asked, why did you do it? Mm -hmm. It was, of course, you know, when you total a car, she could have died, she could have killed somebody else, cops were involved. It's a very high stress situation that resulted in that. <clears throat> so I tried working with the staff, but that did not, uh, the supported housing, it did not work out. I think it just worked out. With and uh, unfortunately, they also made some really uh, bad errors, uh, with, especially with regard to clonazepam prescription. And that, at that point in time, the parents decided that they just wanted to take her back home. And then, after she went back home, she actually settled down. We, we, I have gradually taken her off everything. Uh, she's not on any psychiatric medications. And her cetrazine usage also came down. She was absolutely adamant about not giving up dairy and gluten, not taking the herbal medicines that I was giving. But I did not push that. I said, OK, my main goal is to establish a therapeutic relationship with this young lady. That's what I focused on for all these years. But after she went home, there is familial history of uh, you know, this mom has autoimmunity, older sister also has autoimmunity. So once she went back home, parents and older sister decided to implement the diet. And because of that, she started the diet as well because they were not making any other food at home. And guess what? Her allergies went away. Her immunity got better. She was all, she would be always sick, but that didn't happen. Minimal unpredictability in mood or behavior. Um, and her family is actually beginning to understand what is the meaning of this, and they're helping her to express it verbally rather than physically and in an aggressive manner. Anxiety and insomnia are fully resolved. She has regular sleep-wake cycle. Uh, constipation has also gotten better. She started to uh, take the herbs that I recommended. And uh, I see her now about twice a month, uh, mainly teaching her, uh, giving her a sense of uh, uh, identity and value, and also to teach her uh, how to express herself verbally rather than uh, through physical means. Again, with her, the only thing that I did was listen to her and identify that her symptoms were really a side effect of the medication. 